Chapter 3, The Vicious Circle of Contempt Would not God find a way out, some superior deception, such as the grown-ups and the powerful always contrived, producing one more trump card at the last moment, shaming me after all, not taking me seriously, humiliating me under the damnable mask of kindness. Herman Hesse, A Child's Heart Humiliation for the child, contempt for the weak, and where it goes from there. Everyday Examples while away on a vacation, I was sorting out my thoughts on the subject of contempt and reading various notes on this theme that I had made about individual analytic sessions. Probably sensitized by this preoccupation, I was more than usually affected by an ordinary scene in no way spectacular or rare. I shall describe it to introduce my observations, for it illustrates some of the insights I have gained in the course of my analytic work without any danger of indiscretion. I was out for a walk and noticed a young couple a few steps ahead, both tall. They had a little boy with them, about two years old, who was running alongside and whining. We are accustomed to seeing such situations from the adult point of view, but here I want to describe it as it was experienced by the child. The two had just bought themselves ice cream bars on sticks from the kiosk and were licking them with enjoyment. The little boy wanted one too. His mother said affectionately, Look, you can have a bite of mine. A whole one is too cold for you. The child did not want just one bite, but held out his hand for the whole ice, which his mother took out of his reach again. He cried in despair, and soon exactly the same thing was repeated with the father. There you are, my pet, said his father affectionately. You can have a bite of mine. No, no, cried the child and ran ahead again, trying to distract himself. Soon he came back again and gazed enviously and sadly up at the two grown-ups who were enjoying their ice creams contentedly and at one. Time and time again, he held out his little hand for the whole ice cream bar, but the adult hand with its treasure was withdrawn again. The more the child cried, the more it amused his parents. It made them laugh a lot, and they hoped to humor him along with their laughter too. Look, it isn't so important. What a fuss you're making. Once the child sat down on the ground and began to throw little stones over his shoulder in his mother's direction, but then he suddenly got up again and looked around anxiously, making sure that his parents were still there. When his father had completely finished the ice cream, he gave the stick to the child and walked on. The little boy licked the bit of wood expectantly, looked at it, threw it away, wanted to pick it up again but did not do so, and a deep sob of loneliness and disappointment shook his small body. Then he trotted obediently after his parents. It seemed clear to me that this little boy was not being frustrated in his oral drives, for he was given ample opportunity to take a bite. It was his narcissistic needs that were constantly being wounded and frustrated. His wish to hold the ice cream stick in his hand like the others was not understood. Worse still, it was laughed at. They made fun of his needs. He was faced with two giants who were proud of being consistent and also supported each other, while he, quite alone in his distress, obviously could say nothing beyond no, nor could he make himself clear to his parents with his gestures, which were very expressive. He had no advocate. What an unfair situation it is, by the way, when a child is opposed by two big strong adults, as by a wall. We call it consistency in upbringing when we refuse to let the child complain about one parent to the other. Why indeed did these parents behave with so little empathy? Why didn't one of them think of eating a little quicker, or even of throwing away half his ice cream and giving the child his stick with a bit of edible substance? Why did they both stand there laughing, eating so slowly and showing so little concern about the child's obvious distress? They were not unkind or cold parents, the father spoke to his child very tenderly. Nevertheless, at least at this moment, they displayed a lack of empathy. We can only solve this riddle if we manage to see the parents, too, as insecure children, children who have at last found a weaker creature, and in comparison with him, they now can feel very strong. What child has never been laughed at for his fears and been told, you don't need to be afraid of a thing like that? And what child will then not feel shamed and despised because he could not assess the danger correctly, and will that little person not take the next opportunity to pass on these feelings to a still smaller child? Such experiences come in all shades and varieties, Common to them all is the sense of strength that it gives the adult to face the weak and helpless child's fear and to have the possibility of controlling fear in another person while he cannot control his own. No doubt in 20 years' time, or perhaps earlier, if he has younger siblings, our little boy will replay the scene with the ice cream, but then he will be in possession and the other one will be the helpless, envious, weak little creature whom he then no longer has to carry within himself, but now can split off and project outside himself. Contempt for those who are smaller and weaker thus is the best defense against a breakthrough of one's own feelings of helplessness. It is an expression of this split-off weakness. The strong person who knows that he too carries this weakness within himself because he has experienced it does not need to demonstrate his strength through such contempt. Many adults first become aware of their Oedipal feelings of helplessness, jealousy, and loneliness through their own children since they had no chance to acknowledge and experience these feelings consciously in their childhood. I spoke of the patient who was obsessively forced to make conquests with women, to seduce and then to abandon them, until he was at last able to experience in his analysis how he himself had repeatedly been abandoned by his mother. Now he remembered how he had been caught at night outside the locked door of his parents' bedroom and laughed at. Now in the analytic session is the first time that he consciously experiences the feelings of humiliation and mortification that were then aroused. The Oedipal suffering that was not lived out can be got rid of by delegating it to one's own children in much the same way as in the ice cream scene I have just described.
You see, we are big. We may do as we like, but for you it is too cold. You may only enjoy yourself as we do when you get to be big enough. So in the Oedipal area, too, it is not the instinctual frustration that is humiliating for the child, but the contempt shown for his instinctual wishes. It may well be that the narcissistic component of Oedipal suffering is commonly accentuated when the parents demonstrate their grown-upness to revenge themselves unconsciously on their child for their own earlier humiliation. In the child's eyes, they encounter their own humiliating past, and they must ward it off with the power they now have achieved. In many societies, little girls suffer additional discrimination because they are girls. Since women, however, have control over the newborn and the infants, these erstwhile little girls can pass on to their children at the most tender age the contempt from which they once had suffered. Later, the adult man will idealize his mother, since every human being needs the feeling that he was really loved, but he will despise other women upon whom he thus revenges himself in place of his mother. And these humiliated adult women, in turn, if they have no other means of ridding themselves of their burden, will revenge themselves upon their own children. This indeed can be done secretly and without fear of reprisals, for the child has no way of telling anyone except perhaps in the form of a perversion or obsessional neurosis, whose language is sufficiently veiled not to betray the mother. Contempt is the weapon of the weak, and the defense against one's own despised and unwanted feelings. And the fountainhead of all contempt, all discrimination, is the more or less conscious, uncontrolled, and secret exercise of power over the child by the adult, which is tolerated by society except in the case of murder or serious bodily harm. What adults do to their child's spirit is entirely their own affair. For the child is regarded as the parent's property, in the same way as the citizens of a totalitarian state are the property of its government. Until we become sensitized to the small child's suffering, this wielding of power by adults will continue to be a normal aspect of the human condition, for no one pays attention to or takes seriously what is regarded as trivial, since the victims are only children. But in 20 years' time, these children will be adults who will have to pay it all back to their own children. They may then fight vigorously against cruelty in the world, and yet they will carry within themselves an experience of cruelty to which they have no access and which remains hidden behind their idealized picture of a happy childhood. Let us hope that the degree to which this discrimination is persistently transmitted from one generation to the next might be reduced by education and increasing awareness, especially in its more subtle manifestations. Someone who slaps or hits another or knowingly insults him is aware of hurting him. He has some sense of what he is doing. But how often were our parents and we ourselves toward our own children unconscious of how painfully, deeply, and lastingly we injured a child's tender, budding self? It is very fortunate when our children are aware of this situation and are able to tell us about it, for this may enable them to throw off the chains of power, discrimination, and scorn that have been handed on for generations. When our children can consciously experience their early helplessness and narcissistic rage, they will no longer need to ward off their helplessness in turn with the exercise of power over others. In most cases, however, one's own childhood suffering remains effectively inaccessible, and thus forms the hidden source of new and sometimes very subtle humiliation for the next generation. Various defense mechanisms will help to justify this denial of one's own suffering. Rationalization, I owe it to my child to bring him up properly. Displacement, it is not my father but my son who is hurting me. Idealization, my father's beatings were good for me. And more. And above all, there is the mechanism of turning passive suffering into active behavior. The following examples may illustrate how astonishingly similar the ways are in which people protect themselves against their childhood experiences, despite great differences in personality structure and in education. A 30-year-old Greek, the son of a peasant and owner of a small restaurant in Western Europe, proudly described how he drinks no alcohol and has his father to thank for this abstinence. Once at the age of 15, he came home drunk and was so severely beaten by his father that he could not move for a week. From that time on, he was so averse to alcohol that he could not so much taste as a drop although his work brought him into constant contact with it. When I heard that he was soon to be married, I asked whether he too would beat his children. Of course, he answered, beatings are necessary in bringing up a child properly. They are the best way to make him respect you. I would never smoke in my father's presence, for example, and that is a sign of my respect for him. This man was neither stupid nor uncongenial, but he had little schooling. We might therefore nurse the illusion that education could counteract this process of destroying the spirit. But how does this illusion stand up to the next example, which concerns an educated man? A talented Czech author is reading from his own works in a town in western Germany. After the reading, there follows a discussion with the audience, during which he is asked questions about his life, which he answers ingenuously. He reports that despite his former support of the Prague Spring, he now has plenty of freedom and can frequently travel in the West. He goes on to describe his country's development in recent years. When he's asked about his childhood, his eyes shine with enthusiasm as he talks about his gifted and many-sided father, who encouraged his spiritual development and was a true friend. It was only to his father that he could show his first stories. His father was very proud of him, and even when he beat him as punishment for some misdemeanor reported by the mother, he was proud that his son did not cry. Since tears brought extra blows, the child learned to suppress them, and was himself proud that he could make his admired father such a great present with his bravery. This man spoke of these regular beatings as though they were the most normal things in the world, as for him, of course, they were, 
And then he said, it did me no harm. It prepared me for life, made me hard, taught me to grit my teeth. And that's why I could get on so well in my profession. Contrasting with this Czech author, the film director Ingmar Bergman spoke on the television program with great awareness and far more understanding of the implications about his own childhood, which he described as one long story of humiliation. He related, for example, that if he wet his trousers, he had to wear a red dress all day so that everybody would know what he had done and he wouldn't have to be ashamed of himself. Ingmar Bergman was the younger son of a Protestant pastor. In this television interview, he described a scene that often occurred during his childhood. His older brother had just been beaten by the father. Now their mother is dabbing his brother's bleeding back with cotton wool. He himself sits watching. Bergman described this scene without apparent agitation, almost coldly. One could see him as a child quietly sitting and watching. He surely did not run away, nor close his eyes, nor cry. One has the impression that this scene did take place in reality, but at the same time in a covering memory for what he himself went through. It is unlikely that only his brother was beaten by their father. It sometimes happens that patients in analysis are convinced that only their siblings suffered humiliation. Only after years of analysis can they remember, with feelings of rage and helplessness, of anger and indignation, how humiliated and deserted they felt when they were beaten by their beloved father. Ingmar Bergman, however, had other possibilities apart from projection and denial for dealing with the suffering. He could make films. It is conceivable that we, as the movie audience, have to endure those feelings that he, the son of such a father, could not experience overtly but nevertheless carried within himself. We sit before the screen confronted the way that small boy once was with all the cruelty our brother has to endure and hardly feel able or willing to take in all this brutality with authentic feelings. We ward them off. When Bergman speaks regretfully of his failure to see through Nazism before 1945, although as an adolescent he often visited Germany during the Hitler period, we may see it as a consequence of his childhood. Cruelty was the familiar air that he had breathed from early on, and so why should cruelty have caught his attention? And why did I describe these three examples of men who had been beaten in their childhood? Are these not borderline cases? Do I want to consider the effects of beatings? By no means. We may believe that these three cases are crass exceptions. However, I chose these examples partly because they had not been entrusted to me as secrets but had already been made public. But above all, I meant to show how even the most severe ill treatment can remain hidden because of the child's strong tendency to idealization. There is no trial, no advocate, no verdict. Everything remains hidden in the darkness of the past. And should the facts become known, then they appear in the name of blessings. If this is so with the crassest examples of physical ill treatment, then how is mental torment ever to be exposed when it's less visible and more easily disputed anyway? Who is likely to take serious notice of subtle discrimination, as in the example of the small boy and the ice cream? Metapsychology has no model for these processes. It is concerned with cathexis, with intrapsychic dynamics, object and self-representations, but not with facts that at most are taken into account as the patient's fantasies. Its concern is the meaning attached to experiences and not the reality behind them. Nevertheless, we do analyze parents, too, and we hear about their feelings toward their children and about their narcissistic needs, and we have to ask ourselves what the consequences of all this are for the development of their children. What are we to do with this information? Can we ignore its implications? Can we blind ourselves with the argument that an analyst is only concerned with intrapsychic processes? It is as if we did not dare to take a single step in order to acknowledge the child's reality, since Freud recognized the conjecture of sexual seduction as the patient's fantasy. Since the patient also has an interest in keeping this reality hidden from us, and still more from himself, it can happen that we share his ignorance for a long time. Nevertheless, the patient never stops telling us about part of his reality with the language of his symptoms. Possibly the child's actual seduction did not take place the way Freud's hysterical patients related it. Yet, the parent's narcissistic cathexis of their child leads to a long series of sexual and non-sexual seductions, which the child will only be able to discover with difficulty as an adult in his analysis, and often not before he himself is a parent. A father who grew up in surroundings inimical to instinctual drives may well be inhibited in his sexual relationships and marriage. He may even remain polymorphous, perverse, and first dare to look properly at a female genital, play with it and feel aroused while he is bathing his small daughter. A mother may perhaps have been shocked as a small girl by the unexpected sight of an erect penis and so developed fear of the male genital, or she may have experienced it as a symbol of violence in the primal scene without being able to confide in anyone. Such a mother may now be able to gain control over her fear in relationship to her tiny son. She may, for example, dry him after his bath in such a manner that he has an erection, which is not dangerous or threatening for her. She may massage her son's penis right up to puberty in order to, quote, treat his phimosis without having to be afraid. Protected by the unquestioning love that every child has for his mother, she can carry on with her genuine, hesitating sexual exploration that had been broken off too soon. What does it mean to the child, though, when his sexually inhibited parents make narcissistic use of him in their loneliness and need? Every child seeks loving contact and is happy to get it. At the same time, however, he feels insecure when desires are aroused that do not 
appear spontaneously at this stage in his development. This insecurity is further increased by the fact that his own autoerotic activity is punished by the parents' prohibitions for scorn. There are other ways of seducing the child apart from the sexual, for instance with the aid of indoctrination, which underlies both the anti-authoritarian and the strict upbringing. Neither form of rearing takes account of the child's needs at his particular stage of development. As soon as the child is regarded as a possession for which one has a particular goal, as soon as one exerts control over him, his vital growth will be violently interrupted. It is among the common places of education that we often first cut off the living root and then try to replace its natural functions by artificial means. Thus, we suppress the child's curiosity, for example, like, there are questions one should not ask. And then, when he lacks a natural interest in learning, he is offered special coaching for his scholastic difficulties. We find a similar example in the behavior of addicts, in whom the object relationship has already been internalized. People who as children successfully repress their intense feelings often try to regain, at least for a short time, their lost intensity of experience with the help of drugs or alcohol. If we want to avoid the unconscious seduction and discrimination against the child, we must first gain a conscious awareness of these dangers. Only if we become sensitive to the fine and subtle ways in which a child may suffer humiliation can we hope to develop the respect for him that a child needs from the very first day of his life onward, if he is to develop emotionally. There are various ways to reach this sensitivity. We may, for instance, observe children who are strangers to us and attempt to feel empathy for them in their situation, or we might try to develop empathy for our own fate. For us as analysts, there is also the possibility of following our analysis into his past, if we accept that his feelings will tell us a true story that so far no one else knows. Introjected Contempt in the Mirror of Psychoanalysis Damaged Self-Articulation in the Compulsion to Repeat If we want to do more than provide patients with intellectual insight, or, as may be necessary in some psychotherapies, merely to strengthen their defense mechanisms, then we shall have to embark on a new voyage of discovery with each patient. What we so discover will not be a distant land, but one that does not yet exist, and will only begin to do so in the course of its discovery and settlement. It is a fascinating experience to accompany a patient on this journey, so long as we do not try to enter this new land with concepts that are familiar to us, perhaps in order to avoid our own fear of what is unknown and not yet understood. The patient discovers his true self little by little through experiencing his own feelings and needs, because the analyst is able to accept and respect these even when he does not yet understand them. I am sometimes asked in seminars or supervisor's sessions how one should deal with so-called undesirable feelings, such as the irritation that patients sometimes arouse in their analysts. A sensitive analyst will of course feel this irritation. Should he suppress it to avoid rejecting the patient? But then the patient too will sense this suppressed anger without being able to comprehend it and will be confused. Should the analyst express it? If he does, this may offend the patient and undermine his confidence. I have found that when I do not attempt to respond to such questions and remarks with advice, the discussion among colleagues reaches a much deeper and more personal dimension. The question of how to deal with anger and other feelings in the counter-transference no longer needs to be asked if we begin with the assumption that all the feelings that the patient arouses in his analyst during his analysis are part of his unconscious attempt to tell the analyst his story and at the same time to hide it from him. That is, to protect himself from the renewed manipulation he unconsciously expects. I always assume that the patient has no other way of telling me a story than the one he actually uses. Seen thus, all feelings arising in me, including irritation, belong to his coded language and are of great heuristic value. At times they may help to find the lost key to still invisible doors. At one time there was discussion in the literature about how to recognize whether countertransference feelings are an expression of the analyst's transference. If the analyst has gained emotional access to his own childhood, then he should easily be able to distinguish between countertransference feelings and his own childish ones, his own transference. Feelings that belong to the countertransference are like a quick flash, a signal, and clearly related to the analysis person. When they are intense, tormenting, and continuous, they have to do with oneself. The countertransference indicates either the former attitudes of the patient's primary objects, or the analyst's unconscious rejection of this role, or the child's feelings, split off and never experienced, which the patient in the course of his analysis has delegated to his analyst. Can one portray a story that one does not know? This sounds impossible, but it happens in every analysis. The patient needs the analytic situation as a framework for the development of his transference before he can stage his story and make it understood. He needs somebody who does not need him to behave in a particular manner, but can let him be as he is at the moment, and who at the same time is willing to accept any of the roles with which he may be charged for as long as the analytic process requires. The compulsion to repeat plays a prominent role in an analysis conceived in this way. Much has been written about the negative aspect of the compulsion to repeat. The uncanny tendency to reenact a trauma, which itself is not remembered, at times has something cruel and self-destructive about it, and understandably suggests associations with the death instinct. 
Nevertheless, the need to repeat also has a positive side. Repetition is the language used by a child who has remained dumb, his only means of expressing himself. A dumb child needs a particularly empathetic partner if he is to be understood at all. Speech, on the other hand, is often used less to express genuine feelings and thoughts than to hide, veil, or deny them, and thus to express the false self. And so, there often are long periods in our work with our patients during which we are dependent on their compulsion to repeat. For this repetition is then the only manifestation of their true self. It lays the basis for the transference and also for the whole mise-en-scene of the patient's field of interaction, which in the literature is described as acting out and is often met with mistrust. Take an example. In many analyses, the patient's wish to have a child is expressed during the first weeks or months. For a long time, this wish was traced back to Oedipal wishes. This may well be correct. Nevertheless, the patient's associations often show the narcissistic background to this wish very clearly. For the patient, this means, I want to have somebody whom I can completely possess and whom I can control. My mother always withdrew from me. Somebody who will stay with me all the time, not only for four hours of the week. Right now, I am nobody, but as a mother or as a father, I should be somebody, and others would value me more than they do now that I have no children. Or it may mean, I want to give a child everything that I had to do without. He should be free, not have to deny himself, be able to develop freely. I want to give this chance to another human being. This second variation looks as though it were based on object relationships, but if that were so, the patient would be able to take his time in fulfilling this wish, and to wait until he would be able to give from his abundance toward the end of his analysis. If, however, this wish for a child at the beginning of the analysis cannot be delayed, but shows such urgency, then it is rather an expression of the patient's own great need. Various aspects come together. The wish to have a mother who is available, the child as a new chance to achieve the good symbiosis which the patient still seeks since he has never experienced it. The hope that with this birth the patient may become truly alive, the child as symbol for the patient's true self. Unconscious communication about the patient's own fate as a child with the aid of compulsive repetition, the child as rival sibling and abandoned hope. The sibling's birth had increased the patient's loss of self, and with the birth of his child the patient would give up, for the time being, his hope of realizing his true self. To interpret this questionable wish to have a child as acting out is not usually successful, since the compulsion to repeat is too strong. The analyst is then experienced as a strict mother, against whom the patient would like to rebel. At present, however, the patient can do so only in this self-destructive way, since he is not yet free from introjects. So the analyst is forced to be a spectator while the patient gives life to a new human being, apparently in order to destroy his own chance, but also thereby to rediscover his formerly only half-experienced life and to experience it consciously, now with his newly awakened feelings. Just as a child uses the Sino test figures to represent his family, so the patient unconsciously uses his newborn child to lay out for himself the tragedy of his own fate. This is the double function of the compulsion to repeat. The patient senses that here for the first time he is really involved, that it is his own self that is being born. The wish to have a child expresses this desire, but it has to be expressed through another person. For the patient now will devote himself not to the baby he once was, but to an actual baby in the present. However, since this newborn baby also stands for his own childhood self, the patient can emotionally discover his own warded-off childhood story, piece by piece, partly through identification and partly in the guise of his own parents, whom he gradually discovers within himself. The compulsion to repeat is in fact more or less powerful even outside analysis. It is, for example, well known that partner choice is closely related to the primary object's character. In analysis, however, this tendency is particularly strong, above all because the staging here includes the analyst, and the patient feels that a solution can be found. A detour by way of secondary transference figures is nevertheless often unavoidable, since fear of object loss becomes intolerable as soon as ambivalent feelings develop. It is still necessary to separate the mother as environment from the mother as object. The patient has learned very early in life that he must not show any dissatisfaction or disappointment with the object, since this would lead to the beloved father or mother withdrawing himself and his love. In the analysis, a stage must certainly be reached when even this risk can be endured and survived. Before that time, however, there is a long period when the analyst is needed as a companion, while early experiences with the primary objects, which hitherto were inaccessible to memory, are rediscovered in a trial run with secondary transference figures. The newly won capacity to accept his feelings frees the way for the patient's long-repressed needs and wishes, which nevertheless cannot yet be satisfied without self-punishment, or even cannot in reality be satisfied at all, since they are related to past situations. The latter is clearly seen in the example of the urgent and not-to-be-postponed wish for a child, which, I, as I have tried to describe, expresses, among other things, the wish to have a mother constantly available. All the same, there are needs that can and should be satisfied in the present, and that regularly come up in the analyses of narcissistically disturbed individuals. Among these is every human being's central need to express himself, 
to show himself to the world as he really is, in word, in gesture, in behavior, in every genuine utterance from the baby's cry to the artist's creation. For those people who, as children, had to hide their true selves from themselves and others, this first step into the open produces much anxiety. Yet these people especially feel a great need to throw over their former restraints within the protection of their analysis. These first steps do not lead to freedom, but to a compulsive repetition of the patient's childhood constellation, and so he will experience those feelings of agonizing shame and painful nakedness that accompany self-display. With the infallibility of a sleepwalker, the analysis seeks out those who, like his parents, though for different reasons, certainly cannot understand him. Through his compulsive need to repeat, he will try to make himself understandable to precisely these people, trying to make possible what cannot be. At a particular stage in her analysis, a young woman fell in love with an older, intelligent, and sensitive man who, nevertheless, apart from eroticism, had to ward off and reject everything he could not understand intellectually, including psychoanalysis. Precisely this person was the one to whom she wrote long letters trying to explain the path she had taken in her analysis up to this point. She succeeded in overlooking all his signals of incomprehension and increased her efforts even more, until at last she was forced to recognize that she had again found a father substitute, and that this was the reason why she had been unable to give up her hopes of at last being understood. This awakening brought her agonizingly sharp feelings of shame that lasted for a long time. One day she was able to experience this during a session and said, I feel so ridiculous, as if I had been talking to a wall and expecting it to answer, like a silly child. I asked, would you think it ridiculous if you saw a child who had to tell his troubles to a wall because there was no one else available? The despairing sobbing that followed my question gave the patient access to a part of her former reality that was pervaded by boundless loneliness. It freed her at the same time from her agonizing, destructive, and compulsively repeated feelings of shame. The following day, this patient brought her first poem, which she had written that night. Only much later could she risk repeating this experience with a wall, with me, and not only with subsidiary transference figures. For a time, this woman, who was normally capable of expressing herself so clearly, described everything in such an extraordinarily complicated and precipitate way that I had no chance of understanding it all, probably much like her parents earlier. She went through moments of sudden hate and narcissistic rage, reproaching me with indifference and lack of understanding. My patient now could hardly recognize me anymore, although I had not changed. In this way, she rediscovered with me her own childhood. A child, too, can never grasp the fact that the same mother who cooks so well is so concerned about his cough and helps so kindly with his homework, in some circumstances has no more feeling than a wall for his hidden inner world. This young woman's vehement reproaches that were now directed against me finally released her from her compulsion to repeat, which had consisted of constantly seeking a partner who had no understanding for her or of arranging such a constellation so that she would then feel helplessly dependent on him. The fascination of such tormenting relationships is part of the compulsion constantly to reenact one's earliest disappointments with the parents. Perpetuation of Contempt in Perversion and Obsessional Neurosis If we start from the premise that a person's whole development, and his narcissistic balance that is based upon it, is dependent on the way his mother experienced his expression of needs and sensations during his first days and weeks of life, then we must assume that here the valuation of feelings and impulses is set. If a mother cannot take pleasure in her child as he is, but must have him behave in a particular way, then the first value selection takes place for the child. Now good is differentiated from bad, nice from nasty, and right from wrong, and this differentiation is introjected by the child. Against this background will follow all his further introjections of the parent's more differentiated valuations. Since every mother has her own room full of props, virtually every infant must learn that there are things about him for which the mother has no use. She will expect her child to control his bodily functions as early as possible. On the conscious level, his parents want him to do this so that he will not offend against society, but unconsciously they are protecting their own reaction formation, dating from the time when they were themselves small children afraid of offending. Marie Hesse, the mother of the poet and novelist Hermann Hesse, undoubtedly a sensitive woman, describes in her diaries how her own will was broken at the age of four. When her son was four years old, she suffered greatly under his defiant behavior and battled against it with varying degrees of success. At the age of 15, Hermann Hesse was sent to an institution for the care of epileptics and defectives in Stettin to put an end to his defiance once and for all. In an affecting and angry letter from Stettin, Hesse wrote to his parents, If I were a bigot and not a human being, I could perhaps hope for your understanding. All the same, his release from the home was made conditional upon his improvement, and so the boy improved. In a later poem dedicated to his parents, denial and idealization are restored. He reproaches himself that it had been his character that had made life so difficult for his parents. Many people suffer all their lives from this oppressive feeling of guilt, the sense of not having lived up to their parents' expectations. This feeling is stronger than any intellectual insight that it is not a child's task or duty to satisfy his parents' narcissistic needs.
No argument can overcome these guilt feelings, for they have made their beginnings in life's earliest period, and from that they derive their intensity and abjuracy. That probably greatest of narcissistic wounds, not to have been loved just as one truly was, cannot heal without the work of mourning. It can either be more or less successfully resisted and covered up, as in grandiosity and depression, or constantly torn open again in the compulsion to repeat. We encounter this last possibility in obsessional neurosis and in perversion. The mother's or father's scornful reactions have been interjected. The mother often reacted with surprise and horror, aversion and disgust, shock and indignation, or with fear and panic, to the child's most natural impulses. And so these have been the mother's reactions to such natural impulses as the child's autoerotic behavior, investigating and discovering his own body, oral greed, urination and defecation, touching and playing with his own excrement, or to his curiosity or rage in response to failure or disappointment. Later, all these experiences remain closely linked to the mother's horrified eyes, and this clearly emerges in the analytic transference. The patient goes through torment when he reveals to his analyst his hitherto secret sexual and autoerotic behavior. He may, of course, also relate all this quite unemotionally, merely giving information, as if he were speaking of some other person. Such a report, however, will not help him to break out of his loneliness nor lead him back to the reality of his childhood. It is only when he is encouraged in the analysis not to fend off his feelings of shame and fear, but rather to accept and experience them, that he can discover what he has felt as a child. His most harmless behavior will cause him to feel mean, dirty, or completely annihilated. He himself indeed is surprised when he realizes how long this repressed feeling of shame has survived, and how it has found a place alongside his tolerant and advanced views of sexuality. These experiences first show the patient that his early adaptation by means of splitting was not an expression of cowardice, but that it was really his only chance to escape this sense of impending destruction. What else can one expect of a mother who was always proud of being her mother's dear good daughter, who was dry at the age of six months, clean at a year, and at three could mother her younger siblings, and so forth? In her own baby, such a mother sees the split off and never experienced part of herself, of whose breakthrough into consciousness she is afraid, and she sees also the uninhibited sibling baby, whom she mothered at such an early age, and only now envies and perhaps hates in the person of her own child. So she trains her child with looks, despite her greater wisdom, for she can do nothing else. As the child grows up, he cannot cease living his own truth and expressing it somewhere, perhaps in complete secrecy. In this way, a person can have adapted completely to the demands of his surroundings and can have developed a false self, but in his perversion or his obsessional neurosis, he still allows a portion of his true self to survive in torment. And so the true self lives on, under the same conditions as the child once did with his disgusted mother, whom in the meantime he has introjected. In his perversion and obsessions, he constantly reenacts the same drama. A horrified mother is necessary before drive satisfaction is possible. Orgasm, for instance with a fetish, can only be achieved in a climate of self-contempt. Criticism can only be expressed in seemingly absurd, unaccountable, frightening, obsessional fantasies. Nothing will serve better to acquaint us with the hidden tragedy of certain unconscious mother-child relationships than the analysis of a perversion or an obsessional neurosis. For in such an analysis, we witness the destructive power of the compulsion to repeat, and that compulsion's dumb, unconscious communication in the shaping of its drama. It is of eminent importance that, although the patient has the possibility to experience the analyst as hostile to his drives, critical and contemptuous, yet the analyst should in fact never really be so. This may sound obvious, but it is not always in practice. Sometimes the analyst does just the opposite, quite unconsciously and with the best intentions. It may be that he can hardly bear being turned into a figure so hostile to instinctual drives, and so must demonstrate his tolerance by persuading the patient, for example, to describe his masturbatory preference fearlessly. In doing so, he will prevent the patient from experiencing his mother in the transference. At the same time, this analyst repeats in reality the mother's rejection of the patient's childish instinctual impulses, for he does not allow the childish fear and confusion to come out as they were originally felt and will only speak to his patient on an adult level. One might, in fact, think of it as discrimination, as a devaluation of the childlike, when an analyst emphasizes that for him, of course, his patients are always adults and not children, as if being a child were something to be ashamed of, and not something valuable that we lose later on. Occasionally one hears similar remarks about sickness, when an analyst is eager to consider his patients as healthy as possible, or warns them against dangerous regression, as if sickness were not sometimes the only possible way of expressing the true self. The people who have come to us have, after all, been trying all their lives to be as adult and healthy, normal, as possible. They experience it as a great inner liberation when they discover this socially conditioned straitjacket of child rejection and normalcy worship within themselves and can give it up. A patient who suffers under his perversion bears within himself his mother's rejection, and thus he flaunts his perversion in order to get others to reject him too, all the time, so re-externalizing the rejecting mother. For this reason he feels compelled to do things that his circle and society disapprove of and despise.
If society were suddenly to honor his form of perversion, as may happen in certain circles, he would have to change his compulsion, but it would not free him. What he needs is not permission to use one or another fetish, but the disgusted and horrified eyes. If he comes to analysis, he will look for this in his analyst, too, and will have to use all possible means to provoke him to disgust, horror, and aversion. This provocation is, of course, a part of the transference, and from the incipient countertransference reactions, one can surmise what happened at the beginning of this life. If the analyst can see through to the goals and compulsions behind the provocation, then the whole decayed building collapses and gives way to true, deep, and defenseless mourning. When finally the narcissistic wound itself can be felt, there is no more necessity for all the distortions. This is a clear demonstration of how mistaken the attempt is to show the patient his instinctual conflicts, if he has been trained from earliest childhood on to feel nothing. How can instinctual wishes and conflicts be experienced without feelings? What can orality mean without greed? What anality without defiance and envy? What is the Oedipus complex without feelings of rage, abandonment, jealousy, loneliness, and love? It is very striking to see how often pseudo-instinctual acting out seizes when the patient begins to experience his own feelings and can recognize his true instinctual wishes. The following citation is taken from a report about St. Pauli, Hamburg's Red Light District, that appeared in the German magazine Stern, June 8, 1978. You experience the masculine dream, as seductive as it is absurd, of being coddled by women like a baby and at the same time commanding them like a pasha. This masculine dream, indeed, is not absurd. It arises from the infant's most genuine and legitimate needs. Our world would be very different if the majority of babies had the chance to rule over their mothers like pashas and to be coddled by them, without having to concern themselves with their mother's needs too early. The reporter asked some of the regular clients what gave them most pleasure in these establishments and summarized their answers as follows. That the girls are available and completely at the customer's disposal. They do not require protestations of love like girlfriends. There are no obligations, psychological dramas, nor pangs of conscience when desire has passed. You pay and are free. Even and especially the humiliation that such an encounter also involves for the client can increase stimulation, but that is less willingly mentioned. The humiliation, self-disgust, and self-contempt are intrapsychic reflections of the primary object's contempt, and, through the compulsion to repeat, they produce the same tragic conditions for pleasure. Perversion is a borderline case, but gives us an understanding that is valid for the treatment of other disorders, namely understanding of the great importance to be attached to unconscious introjected contempt. What is unconscious cannot be abolished by proclamation or prohibition. One can, however, develop sensitivity toward recognizing it and can experience it consciously, and thus gain control over it. A mother can have the best intentions to respect her child, and yet be unable to do so, so long as she does not realize what deep shame she causes him with an ironic remark, intended only to cover her own uncertainty. Indeed, she cannot be aware of how deeply humiliated, despised, and devalued her child feels if she herself has never consciously suffered these feelings, and if she tries to fend them off with irony. It can be the same for us in our analytic work. Certainly, we do not use words like bad, dirty, naughty, egoistic, rotten, but among ourselves we speak of narcissistic, exhibitionistic, destructive, and regressive patients without noticing that we unconsciously give these words a pejorative meaning. It may be that in our abstract vocabulary, in our objective attitudes, even in the way we formulate our theories, we have something in common with a mother's contemptuous looks, which we can trace to the accommodating three-year-old little girl within her. It is understandable that a patient's scornful attitude should induce an analyst to protect his superiority with the help of theory, but in such a dugout, the patient's true self will not pay us a visit. It will hide from us just as it did from the mother's disgusted eyes. However, we make good use of our sensitivity. We can detect the successive installments in the story of a despised child that lies behind all the analysis expressions of contempt. When that happens, it is easier for the analyst not to feel he is being attacked and to drop his inner need to hide behind his theories. The knowledge of theory is surely helpful, but only when it has lost its defensive function, when it no longer is the successor of a strict controlling mother, forcing the analyst to accommodate himself and narrowing his possibilities. Then the knowledge of theory is like Winnicott's teddy bear lying about, simply within breach when it is needed. Depravity in Herman Hesse's childhood world as an example of concrete evil. It is very difficult to describe how a person has dealt with the contempt under which he had suffered as a child, especially the contempt for all his sensual enjoyment and pleasure in living without giving concrete examples. With the aid of various metapsychological models, one could certainly portray the intrapsychic dynamics, shifts in cathexis, structural changes, and various defense mechanisms, especially the defense against affect. None of this, however, would communicate the emotional climate which alone evokes a person's suffering, and so will make identification and empathy possible for the reader. With purely theoretical representations, we remain outside, can talk about the others, classify, group, and label them, and discuss them in a language that only we understand. There is, of course, an inequality in the analytic setting between the analyst on his couch and the analyst in his chair, which has both point and validity. 
but there is no essential reason to extend it to other situations, such as discussions, lectures, and articles. Thus, I must reduce the inequality and distance between couch and chair and myself if I want to avoid degrading patients to scientific specimens for my study. How is this to be put into practice if one feels called upon not only to accompany the patient, but also to pass on the experience one has gained? Metapsychological concepts alone do not make it clear how far we all, as human beings, as small children and as analysis, have need of our own common sensitivity. If, however, I describe examples in detail, then I am in danger of revealing a person's secret and hidden tragedy to the world. I thereby should, in effect, though not by intention, be repeating the mother's lack of respect, for instance, when she discovered the child's masturbation and shamed him for it. Yet, it is only through the concrete example of a specific life that we can show how a person has experienced the concrete naughtiness of his childhood as wickedness itself. Only the history of an individual life will make us realize how impossible it is for an individual to recognize his parents' compulsion as such, once they have become part of himself, although he may try all his life to break out of this inner prison. In this dilemma between metapsychology and indiscretion, I have decided to use the example of the poet and novelist Hermann Hesse to demonstrate the very complicated situation. This eliminates from the beginning any moral evaluation, and although it does not concern a perversion, it does seem to me to have something in common with the early history of a perversion, namely the introjection of parental contempt for the child's instinctual needs. This example also has the advantage that it has been published, and published by the person himself, so that the connections that I shall postulate can be clarified with concrete examples from his life. At the beginning of his novel Demian, Hermann Hesse describes the goodness and purity of a parental home that gave neither a place nor a hearing to a child's fibs. It is not difficult to recognize the author's own parental home in this novel, and he confirms this indirectly. Thus the child is left alone with his sin and feels that he is depraved, wicked, and outcast, though nobody scolds him, since nobody knows the terrible facts, and everyone shows him kindness and friendliness. Many people recognize this situation. The idealizing way of describing such a so-called pure household is not strange to us either, and it reflects both the child's point of view and the hidden cruelty of educational methods that we know well. Like most parents, writes Hesse, mine were no help with the new problems of puberty, to which no reference was ever made. All they did was take endless trouble in supporting my hopeless attempts to deny reality and to continue dwelling in a childhood world that was becoming more and more unreal. I have no idea whether parents can be of help, and I do not blame mine. It was my own affair to come to terms with myself and to find my own way, and like most well-brought-up children, I managed it badly. To a child, his parents seem to be free of instinctual wishes, for they have means and possibilities of hiding their sexual satisfactions, whereas the child is always under surveillance. In his story A Child's Heart, Hesse writes, the adults acted as if the world were perfect, and as if they themselves were demigods, we children were nothing but scum. Again and again, after a few days, even after a few hours, something happened that should not have been allowed, something wretched, depressing, and shaming. Again and again, in the midst of the noblest and staunchest decisions and vows, I fell abruptly, inescapably, into sin and wickedness, into ordinary bad habits. Why was it this way? The first part of Demian, it seems to me, is very evocative and easy to appreciate, even for people from quite different milieu. What makes the later parts of the novel so peculiarly difficult must be in some way related to Hesse's introjection of his parents' and grandparents' emotional values. They were missionary families, which is to be felt in many of his stories, but can perhaps most easily be shown in Demian. Although Sinclair has already had his own experience of cruelty, blackmail by an older boy, this has had no effect and gives him no key to a better understanding of the world. Wickedness, for him, is depravity. Here is the missionary's language. It is neither the hate, nor the ambivalence, nor the cruelty that are present in every human being, and that Sinclair himself has already experienced, but such trivialities as drinking in a tavern. The little boy Hermann Hesse took over from his parents this particular concept of wickedness as depravity. It is not rooted in his personality, but is like a foreign body. This is why everything in Demian that happens under the appearance of the god Abraxas, who is to unite the ungodly and the devilish, is so curiously removed, it no longer touches us. Wickedness here is supposed to be artfully united with goodness. One has the impression that for the boy this is something strange, threatening, and above all unknown, from which he nevertheless cannot free himself, because of his emotional cathexis of depravity, which is already joined to fear and guilt. Once more I was trying most strenuously to construct an intimate world of light for myself, out of the shambles of a period of devastation. Once more I sacrificed everything within me to the aim of banishing darkness and evil from myself. In the Zurich Exhibition, 1977, to commemorate the centenary of Hesse's birth, there was a picture with which the little Hermann grew up, since it hung above his bed. In this picture, on the right, we see the good road to heaven, full of thorns, difficulties, and suffering. On the left, we see the easy, pleasurable road that inevitably leads to hell. Taverns play a prominent part on this road. The devout women probably hope to keep their husbands and sons away from these wicked places with this threatening representation. <laughs> 
These taverns play an important role in Demian, too. This is particularly grotesque because Hesse had no urge at all to get drunk in such taverns, though he certainly did wish to break out of the narrowness of his parental system of values. Every child forms his first image of what is bad, quite concretely, by what is forbidden, by his parents' prohibitions, taboos, and fears. He will have a long way to go until he can free himself from these parental values and discover his own badness in himself. He then will no longer regard it as depraved and wicked, because it is instinctual, but as an aspect of life from which no human being can be free at bottom, although the strength of their disavowal may be sufficient for some people to convince themselves that they are. Possibly Hermann Hesse, in his puberty, also had to live out his father's split-off and denied depravity, and this he tried to portray in his books. Perhaps this is why there is so much in his novels that is not easy to empathize with, although it communicates the atmosphere under which Hesse suffered as a child, and from which he could not free himself, because he had been compelled to interject it so very early. The following passage from Demian shows how deeply the loss of the loved objects threatened Hesse's search for his true self. But where we have given of our love and respect, not from habit but of our own free will, where we have been disciples and friends out of our inmost hearts, it is a bitter and horrible moment when we suddenly recognize that the current within us wants to pull us away from what is dearest to us. Then every thought that rejects the friend and mentor turns on our own hearts like a poisoned barb. Then each blow struck in defense flies back into one's own face. The words disloyalty and ingratitude strike the person who feels he was morally sound, like catcalls and stigma, and the frightened heart flees timidly back to the charmed valleys of childhood virtues, unable to believe that this break too must be made, this bond also broken. And in a child's heart we read, If I were to reduce all my feelings and their painful conflicts to a single name, I can think of no other word but dread. It was dread, dread and uncertainty, that I felt in all those hours of shattered childhood felicity. Dread of punishment, dread of my own conscience, dread of stirrings in my soul which I consider forbidden and criminal. In his story A Child's Heart, Hesse portrays with great tenderness and understanding the feelings of an eleven-year-old boy who had stolen some dried figs from his beloved father's room so that he could have in his possession something that belonged to his father. Guilt feelings, fear and despair torment him in his loneliness and are replaced at last by the deepest humiliation and shame when his wicked deed is discovered. The strength of this portrayal leads us to surmise that it concerns a real episode from Hesse's own childhood. This surmise becomes certainty thanks to a note made by his mother on November 11, 1889, Herman's theft of figs discovered. From the entries in his mother's diary, and from the extensive exchange of letters between both parents and various members of the family, which have been available since 1966, it is possible to guess at the small boy's painful path. Hesse, like so many gifted children, was so difficult for his parents to bear, not despite but because of his inner riches. Often a child's very gifts, his great intensity of feeling, depth of experience, curiosity, intelligence, quickness, and his ability to be critical, will confront his parents with conflicts that they have long sought to keep at bay with rules and regulations. These regulations must then be rescued at the cost of the child's development. All this can lead to the apparently paradoxical situation when parents who are proud of their gifted child and who even admire him are forced by their own distress to reject, suppress, or even destroy what is best because truest in that child. Two of Hesse's mother's observations may illustrate how this work of destruction can be combined with loving care. 1. 1881. Herman is going to nursery school. His violent temperament causes us much distress. The child was three years old. 2. 1884. Things are going better with Herman, whose education causes us so much distress and trouble. From the 21st of January to the 5th of June, he lived wholly in the boys' house and only spent Sundays with us. He behaved well there, but came home pale, thin, and depressed. The effects were decidedly good and salutary. He is much easier to manage now. The child now was seven years old. On November 14th, 1883, his father, Johannes Hesse, writes, Herman, who was considered almost a model of good behavior in the boys' house, is sometimes hardly to be born. Although it would be very humiliating for us, I am earnestly considering whether we should not place him in an institution or another household. We are too nervous and weak for him, and the whole household is too undisciplined and irregular. He seems to be gifted for everything. He observes the moon and the clouds, extemporizes for long periods on the harmonium, draws wonderful pictures with pencil or pen, can sing quite well when he wants to, and is never at a loss for a rhyme. In the strongly idealized picture of his childhood and his parents, which we encounter in Hermann Lauscher, Hesse has completely abandoned the original rebellious, difficult, and for his parents' troublesome child he once was. Quote, when my childhood at times stirs my heart, it is like a gold-framed, deep-toned picture in which predominates a wealth of chestnuts and alders, an indescribably delightful morning light, and a background of splendid mountains. All the hours in my life in which I was allowed a short period of peace forgetful of the world, all the lonely walks which I took over beautiful mountains, all the moments in which an unexpected happiness or love without desire carried me away from yesterday and tomorrow, 
All these can be given no more precious name than when I compare them with this green picture of my earliest life. He had no way to accommodate this important part of his self, and so was forced to expel it. Perhaps this is why his great and genuine longing for his true self remained unfulfilled. That Hermann Hesse was not deficient in courage, talent, or depth of feeling is of course evident in his works and many of his letters, especially the unforgettable letter from Stettin. But his father's answer to this letter, his mother's notes, and the passages from Demian and Kinderseel, quoted above, show us clearly how the crushing weight of his introjects became his fate. Despite his enormous acclaim and success, and despite the Nobel Prize, Hesse in his mature years suffered from the tragic and painful feeling of being separated from his true self, which doctors refer to currently as depression. The mother during the first years of life, as society's agent. If we were to tell a patient that in other societies his perversion would not be a problem, that it is a problem here surely because it is our society that is sick and produces constrictions and constraints, this would certainly be partially true, but it would be of little help to him. He would feel rather that as an individual with his own individual history, he was being passed over and misunderstood. For this interpretation makes too little of his own very real tragedy. What most needs to be understood is his compulsion to repeat, and the state of affairs behind it to which this compulsion bears witness. All of this, no doubt, is the result of social pressures, and these do not have their effect on his psyche through abstract knowledge, but are anchored in his earliest effective experience with his mother. His problems cannot be solved with words, but only through experience. Not merely corrective experience as an adult, but above all through a reliving of his early fear of his beloved mother's contempt and his subsequent feelings of indignation and sadness. Mere words, however skilled the interpretation, will leave the split from which he suffers unchanged or even deepened. One can therefore hardly free a patient from the cruelty of his introjects by showing him how the absurdity, exploitation, and perversity of society causes our neuroses and perversions, however true this may be. Freud's patient Dora became sick because of society's sexual hypocrisy, which she was unable to see through. Things we can see through do not make us sick. They may arouse our indignation, anger, sadness, or feelings of impotence. What makes us sick are those things we cannot see through, society's constraints that we have absorbed through our mother's eyes, eyes in an attitude from which no reading or learning can free us. To put it another way, our patients are intelligent, they read in newspapers and books about the absurdity of the armaments race, about exploitation through capitalism, diplomatic insincerity, the arrogance and manipulation of power, submission of the weak and the impotence of individuals, and they have thought about these subjects. What they do not see, because they cannot see it, is the absurdities of their own mothers at a time when they still were tiny children. One cannot remember one's parents' attitudes then, because one was a part of them, but in analysis, this early interaction can be recalled and parental constraints are thus more easily disclosed. Political action can be fed by the unconscious anger of children who have been so misused, imprisoned, exploited, cramped, and drilled. This anger can be partially discharged in fighting our institutions without having to give up the idealization of one's own mother, as one knew her in one's childhood. The old dependency can then be shifted to a new object. If, however, disillusionment and the resultant mourning can be lived through an analysis, then social and political disengagement do not usually follow, but the patient's actions are freed from the compulsion to repeat. The inner necessity to constantly build up new illusions and denials in order to avoid the experience of our own reality disappears once this reality has been faced and experienced. We then realize that all our lives we have feared and struggled to ward off something that really cannot happen any longer. It has already happened, happened at the very beginning of our lives, while we were completely dependent. The situation is similar in regard to creativity. Here the prerequisite is the work of mourning, not a neurosis, although people often think it is the latter, and many artists believe that analysis, the mother, would take away their creativity. Let us assume that an analyst tries to talk a patient out of his guilt feelings by tracing a strict superego back to those of society's norms that serve particular capitalist interests. This interpretation is not false. Society not only suppresses instinctual wishes, but also, and above all, it suppresses particular feelings, for instance, anger, and narcissistic needs for esteem mirroring respect, whose admissibility in adults and fulfillment in children would lead to individual autonomy and emotional strength, and thus would not be consonant with the interests of those in power. However, this oppression and this forcing of submission do not only begin in the office, factory, or, or political party, they begin in the very first weeks of an infant's life. Afterward, they are internalized and repressed, and are then, because of their very nature, inaccessible to argument. Nothing is changed in the character of submission or dependency when it is only their object that is changed. Therapeutic effects, in the form of temporary improvement, may be achieved if a strict superego can be replaced by the analyst's mere tolerant one. The aim of analysis, however, is not to correct the patient's fate, but to enable him to confront both his own fate and his mourning over it. The patient has to discover the parents of his early years in the transference and within himself, 
and must become consciously aware of his parents' unconscious manipulation and unintended contempt, so that he can free himself from them. So long as he has to make do with the tolerant substitute superego, borrowed from his analyst, his contemptuous introject will remain unchanged and hidden in his unconscious, despite all his better conscious knowledge and intentions. Although this contemptuous introject will show itself in the patient's human relationships and will torment him, it will be inaccessible to any working through. The contents of the unconscious, as Freud said, remain unchanged and timeless. Change can only begin as these contents become conscious. The Loneliness of the Contemptuous The contempt shown by narcissistically disturbed patients, to which Kernberg points with much emphasis, 1970, may have various forerunners in their life history. These may have been, for instance, the stupid little brothers and sisters, or the uneducated parents who don't understand anything. But the function all these expressions of contempt have in common is the defense against unwanted feelings. Contempt for younger siblings often hides envy of them, just as contempt for the parents often helps to ward off the pain of being unable to idealize them. Contempt also may serve as a defense against other feelings, and it will lose its point when it fails as a shield, for instance against shame over one's unsuccessful courting of the parent of the opposite sex, or against the feeling of inadequacy and rivalry with the same sex parent, and above all against narcissistic rage that the object is not completely available. So long as one despises the other person and overvalues one's own achievements, he can't do what I can do, one does not have to mourn the fact that love is not forthcoming without achievement. Nevertheless, avoiding the mourning means that one remains at bottom the one who is despised, for I have to despise everything in myself that is not wonderful, good, and clever. Thus I perpetuate intrapsychically the loneliness of childhood. I despise weakness, impotence, uncertainty, in short, the child in myself and in others. The patient seldom directly expresses his contempt for the analyst at the beginning of treatment. At first his scorn is consciously directed at other people. He thinks, for example, I don't need any childish feelings. They are all right for my younger brothers and sisters, who do not have my judgment. Anyway, it's only sentimental stuff. Ridiculous. I'm grown up. I can think and act. I can make changes in things around me. I don't need to feel helpless anymore or dependent. If I am afraid, I can do something about it or try to understand it intellectually. My intelligence is my most reliable companion. Well, all that sounds pretty good. But the analysis comes to analysis because he feels lonely, despite or even because of his clear superiority, and because he suffers from difficulties in making contact, or perhaps he comes because he suffers from compulsions or perversions. In the course of analysis, it can then be seen how far this contempt has protected him from his own feelings. Sometimes contemptuous feelings toward the analyst will show up very early in the analysis, but this can only be worked through when the analysis has found his broader basis for his whole world of feeling on which he can then play out and work through his ambivalence. It is then decisive that the analyst should not let himself be provoked into demonstrating his own superiority to the patient. The contempt that Kernberg describes as ubiquitous and grandiose successful people always includes contempt for their own true selves. For their scorn implies, without these qualities which I have, a person is completely worthless. That means further, without these achievements, these gifts, I could never be loved, would never have been loved. Thus, the small powerless child, who is helplessly dependent on others, and also the awkward or difficult child, will have to suffer contempt. Grandiosity guarantees that the illusion continues. I was loved. Those whose grandiose false self needs to act out the certainty are often envied or admired by those whose narcissistic disturbance has a primarily depressive structure, whereas the grandiose will despise the depressives. Nevertheless, this is no basis for a typology, since grandiosity and depression expresses the same underlying problem. Contempt as a rule will cease with the beginning of mourning for the irreversible that cannot be changed. For contempt, too, had, in its own way, served to deny the reality of the past. It is, after all, less painful to think that the others do not understand because they're too stupid. Then one can make efforts to explain things to them. This is the process described by Kohut that takes place when idealization of the self-object fails and the grandiose self has to be cathected. There seems to be a way out, in fantasy at least. Through one's own grandiosity, power as such can be salvaged, and so the illusion of being understood, if only I can express myself properly, can be maintained. Devastating examples of this process are the works of Van Gogh and of the Swiss painter Max Gubler, who so wonderfully and so unsuccessfully courted the favor of their mothers with all the means at their disposal. If, however, this effort is relaxed, one is forced to see how little there was on the other side and how much one has invested oneself. One must come to realize that here a general understanding as such is not possible, since each person is individually stamped by his own fate and his own childhood. Many patients, even with the best intentions, cannot always understand their child, since they too have been stamped by their experience with their own parents and have grown up in a different generation. It is indeed a great deal when parents can respect their children's feelings even when they cannot understand them. There is no contempt in saying it was not possible. It is a reconciliatory recognition that is hard to achieve. A detailed example may illustrate this.
A patient who had sought a second analysis because of tormenting obsessions repeatedly dreamed that he was on a lookout tower that stood in a swampy area at the edge of a town dear to him. From there he had a lovely view, but he felt sad and deserted. There was an elevator in the tower, and in the dream there were all kinds of difficulties over entrance tickets and obstacles on the way to this tower. In reality, the town had no such tower, but it belonged unequivocally to the patient's dream landscape, and he knew it well. The phallic meaning of this dream had been considered in his previous analysis, and it was certainly not wrong to see this aspect, though it was obviously not sufficient since the dream recurred later with the same feelings of being deserted. Interpretation of instinctual conflicts had absolutely no effect. The obsessional symptoms remained unchanged. Only after much had changed in the course of the analysis were there new variations in the dream too, and at last it changed in a decisive way. The patient first was surprised to dream that he already had entrance tickets, but the tower had been demolished and there was no longer a view. Instead he saw a bridge that joined the swampy district to the town. He could thus go on foot into the town and saw not everything, but some things close up. The patient, who suffered from an elevator phobia, was somehow relieved, for riding in this elevator had caused him considerable anxiety. Speaking of the dream, he said he was perhaps no longer dependent on always having a complete view, on always seeing everything, being on top, and cleverer than other people. He now could go on foot like everyone else. The patient was the more astonished when, toward the end of his analysis, he dreamed that he was suddenly sitting in this elevator in the tower again, and was drawn upward as in a chairlift without feeling any fear. He enjoyed the ride, got out at the top, and, strange to say, there was colorful life all about him. It was a plateau, and from it he had a view of the valleys. There was also a town up there, with a bazaar full of colorful wares, a school where children were practicing ballet and he could join in. This had been a childhood wish, and groups of people holding discussions with whom he sat and talked. He felt integrated into the society just as he was. This dream impressed him deeply and made him happy, and he said, My earlier dreams of the tower showed my isolation and loneliness. At home, as the eldest, I was always ahead of my siblings. My parents could not match my intelligence, and in all intellectual matters I was alone. The town he loved was a European center of culture. On the one hand, I had to demonstrate my knowledge in order to be taken seriously, and on the other I had to hide it where my parents would say, Your studies are going to your head. Do you think you're better than everyone else just because you had the chance to study? Without your mother's sacrifice and your father's hard work, you would never have been able to do it. That made me feel guilty, and I tried to hide my difference, my interests, and my gifts. I wanted to be like the others, but that would have meant being untrue to myself. So the patient had searched for this tower and had struggled with obstacles, on the way with entrance tickets, his fears, and more, and when he got to the top, that is, was cleverer than the others, he felt lonely and deserted. It is a well-known and common paradox that parents take up this grudging and competitive attitude toward their child, understandable in view of their envy, and at the same time urge him on to the greatest achievement and, in identification, are proud of his success. Thus the patient had to look for the tower and had to encounter obstacles too, in his analysis, he went through a revolt against his pressure toward achievement, and so the tower disappeared in the first of the dreams as I have described here. He could give up his grandiose fantasy of seeing everything from above, and could look at things in his beloved town, into his self, from close by. The second dream came at a time when he first succeeded in expressing and experiencing himself in an artistic profession, and was receiving a lively echo. This time he did not meet the proud and envious parent figures whom he feared, but true partners in a group. Thus ended not only his tower existence, but almost at the same time his contempt for others who were not so clever and quick, for instance in his first highly specialized profession. Only now did it become clear to him that he had felt compelled to isolate himself from others by means of his contempt, and at the same time was isolated and separated from his true self, at least from his helpless uncertain part. The integration of this side of his personality put him in the way of a daring and very successful change of profession that gave him much happiness. And now, after five years of analysis, this patient could become aware of his Oedipal fate with an intensity and richness of feeling perhaps no one could have suspected earlier in this scornful, distant, and intellectualizing man. Achieving Freedom from the Contemptuous Introjects Sexual perversions and obsessional neuroses are not the only possibilities of perpetuating the tragedy of early suffering from contempt. There are countless forms in which we may observe the fine nuances of this tragedy. The child in the adult is full of narcissistic rage against his mother because she was not available to him and because she rejected some parts of his self, and in the analysis, for instance, this rage at first finds expression in the same form as that in which he felt rejected by his mother. There are many ways in which one may transmit the discrimination under which one has suffered as a child. There are people, for example, who may never say a loud or angry word, who seem to only be good and noble, and who still give others the palpable feeling of being ridiculous or stupid or too noisy, at any rate too common compared with themselves. They do not know it, and surely do not intend it, but this is what they radiate. They have introjected a parental attitude of which they have never been aware. The children of such parents find it particularly difficult to formulate any reproach in their analysis. Then there are the people who can be very friendly, perhaps a shade patronizing, but in whose presence one feels as if one were nothing. 
they convey the feeling that they are the only ones who exist, the only ones who have anything interesting or relevant to say. The others can only stand there and admire them in fascination, or turn away in disappointment and sorrow about their own lack of worth, unable to express themselves in these persons' presence. These people might be the children of grandiose parents, with whom these children had no hope of rivalry, and so later as adults they unconsciously pass on this atmosphere to those around them. Now those people who as children were intellectually far beyond their parents and therefore admired by them, but so also had to solve their own problems alone, will give us quite a different impression. These people will give us a feeling of their intellectual strength and willpower, and they also seem to demand that we too ought to fight off any feeling of weakness with intellectual means. In their presence one feels one can't be recognized as a person with problems, just as they and their problems had not been recognized by their parents, for whom they always had to be strong. Keeping these examples in mind, it is easy to see why some professors, who are quite capable of expressing themselves clearly, will use such complicated and convoluted language when they present their ideas that the students can only acquire them in a fog of anger and diligence, without being able to make much use of them. These students, then, may well have the same sorts of feelings that their teacher once had and was forced to suppress in relation to his parents. If the students themselves become teachers one day, they will have the opportunity of handing on this unusable knowledge, like a pearl of great price, because it had cost them so much. It greatly aids the success of analytic work when the patient can become aware of the inner objects that work within him. Here's an example. At a certain point in her analysis, a patient suddenly began to help her very intelligent ten-year-old daughter with her schoolwork, although the girl had never had any difficulty in doing it alone. The patient's conscious motive was a bit of general advice from the teacher at a parent-teacher meeting. The child soon lost her spontaneity in learning, became unsure of herself, and actually began to have difficulty with her schoolwork. Now the patient's continued supervision of her daughter's homework was fully justified. The patient's own mother, a teacher, had been very proud of her pedagogic talent. She could, as she put it, make something out of any child. She was one of those unsure mothers who would even teach their children to walk and talk if they could. By then, both the patient and I knew this, for the patient had repeatedly experienced her mother in me in the transference, and she had fantasized that I was less concerned with her than with my own success and the confirmation of my own value in wanting her analysis to turn out well. Thereafter, she had remembered and experienced in her dreams scenes with her mother that confirmed these feelings. But that did not suffice. The patient also needed to discover her mother in herself, had to see how she had become so afraid, quite unrealistically, that her daughter would compromise her in her ability as a mother before the teacher. She hated her own compulsion to meddle in her daughter's life, and experienced it as something foreign to her nature. But she could not give up this need to supervise the child. At last she found help through her dreams, in which she felt that she herself was in her mother's situation during the post-war period. Now she was able to imagine how it had been for her mother, who had been widowed early and had to make her own way, for herself and her daughter, and apparently also had to contend with public opinion, which had it that because she went out to work she was neglecting her daughter. Her only child, my patient, had therefore to be the more perfect. The family constellation in the daughter's case was quite different, however, and the need to supervise her child disappeared when my patient realized this difference. I am a different person, and my fate is different from that of my mother, she once said. As a result, not only the teacher, but also her husband and neighbors spontaneously stopped giving her good advice and veiled orders. There are moments in every analysis when damned-up demands, fears, criticism, or envy break through for the first time. With amazing regularity, these impulses appear in a guise that the patient has never expected, or that he might even have rejected and feared all his life. Before he can develop his own form of criticism, he first adopts his father's hated vocabulary or nagging manner, and the long repressed anxiety will surface in, of all things, his mother's irritating hypochondriacal fears. It is as if the badness in the parents that have caused a person the most suffering in his childhood, and that he had always wanted to shun, had to be discovered within himself, so that reconciliation will become possible. Perhaps this also is part of the never-ending work of mourning that this personal stamp must be accepted as part of one's own fate before one can become at least partially free. When the patient has truly emotionally worked through the history of his childhood and thus regained his sense of being alive, then the goal of the analysis has been reached. Afterward, it is up to the patient whether he will take a regular job or not, whether he wants to live alone or with a partner, whether he wants to join a political party, and if so, which one. All that is his own decision. His life story, his experiences, and what he has learned from them will all play a role in how he will live. It is not the task of the analyst to socialize him or to bring him up, not even politically, for every form of bringing up denies his autonomy, nor to make friendships possible for him. All that is his own affair. When the patient, in the course of his analysis, has consciously repeatedly experienced, and not only learned from the analyst's interpretations, how the whole process of his bringing up did manipulate him in his childhood, and what desires for revenge this has left him with, then he will see through manipulation quicker than before, and will himself have less need to manipulate others. Such a patient will be able to join groups without again becoming helplessly dependent or bound, for he has gone through the helplessness and dependency of his childhood in the transference, 
he will be in less danger of idealizing people or systems if he has realized clearly enough how, as a child, he had taken every word uttered by mother or father for the deepest wisdom. He may experience, however, while listening to a lecture or reading a book, the same old childish fascination and admiration, but he will recognize at the same time the underlying emptiness or human tragedy that lurks behind these words and shudder at it. Such a person cannot be tricked with fascinating, incomprehensible words, since he has matured through his own experience. Finally, a person who has consciously worked through the whole tragedy of his own fate will recognize another suffering more clearly and quickly, though the other may still have to try and hide it. He will not be scornful of others' feelings, whatever their nature, because he can take his own feelings seriously. He surely will not help to keep the vicious circle of contempt turning. All these things are not demands I make on my patients because of my own wishes or ideology. They are simply the result of the experience that I have gained through my work with my analysins, and that could be attributed to the effects of their regained sense of being truly alive.